Hello and welcome to The Art Of, our regular in-depth look at different aspects of the beautiful game. Today, we're going to be getting technical in between the lines and admiring some of the finest finishes and footwork the Premier League has ever seen as we delve into The Art Of, the number 10. And I'm joined in the studio by the Tottenham legend, former England manager, part-time rock star, one of the greatest <laughs> football brains that there is, Mr Glenn Hoddle. And we're going to see what's inside that wonderful head of yours, Glenn, because every former player and pundit I speak to praises you so much about your tactical look at the game. And look, we're talking to one of the pioneers of the 10 role, aren't we? I mean, is that fair well, to say, particularly in this country, in the UK? Maybe, maybe. Back in our day, there wasn't the number 10 uh, world. That was the problem. There mm. wasn't really a fixed position for it. Um, it was one of those positions that I didn't think uh, the English coaches trusted. Mm. They didn't really trust that creative player. Everything was more of a 4-4-2. I probably only played for England once in the number 10 position. Um, against Hungary, just in behind two strikers. And I think for one season, really, at Tottenham, before I went to Monaco, I played as a number 10 just behind Clive Allen mm. and uh, had the freedom to go and play where I felt I should have played all my career, really. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was always a bit frustrating for me. But as we just saw those clips, the number 10 is the most beautiful and the most artistic creator on a football pitch. Mm -hmm. It's got to be said, and when you see them clips, and we can go back further, you know, to, to, to Maradona and, and Pele and all them players, mm. they just roll off the tongue. You, you would pay money, you'd pay money to go and watch them players. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a number 10 on, on the sort of entertainment side of football. You've got to be a winner, of course you have. Those guys we've just seen and we're going to be seeing now, yeah. they're all winners. But you would actually pay, I would pay money now to go and watch certain players in the mm. game today. Um, whereas a lot of them I wouldn't, if mm. I'm honest. But it's normally the number 10 position that wasn't looked at as the most important position in this country mm. for so, so long, the way we played. Where did it emerge from then? Because you said when you went to Monaco, they were doing that every week, playing a 10, weren't they? In France and Germany and... Spain. And that's what I looked at. I looked at every World Cup, every European Championships, every European Games, when we played against opposition, they had a number 10 position. And you know what? Until I went to France, it was the most important position on the pitch. Mm. Your, your, play, your teammates knew that. The manager expected that. Even the media and the fans knew that there was a number 10 role and that was the most important. Platini in France is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You know, Zidane in France, they had them. Mm. And this is something that I looked at as a player, a young player particularly, and it did frustrate me that there was no real player. Even at Tottenham, I played on the right side of a diamond all my life, really. Yeah. Ricky Veer ended up playing behind the front two, Archibald and Crooks, because of he couldn't defend, defend. You know, I weren't great defender, but Ricky was even worse than me. So <laughs> he got put in the 10 position where he, he could be protected. Did you love it? Did you come alive in the 10 later in yeah. his first career then? Yeah, I loved that time I played that one season at Tottenham. Um, Clive Allen scored 49 goals that year. He had Chrissy Waddle out there, me just as the 10. He had Ozzy and Paul Allen just behind and, and Tony Galvin or Stevie Hodger. We had a lovely balance in midfield behind one striker then, before now, because a lot of teams play obviously with one striker. Mm. But I loved playing that position. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, as soon as I went to Monaco, there was, that position was, was given to me. 
Arsene Wenger I was working with, which was wonderful, said to me, it took 45 minutes for him to tell me, you're coming back too deep, Glenn. Mm. And it was a pre-season game. Yeah. And it was like music to my ears. He said, no, we want you as the number 10. When we win the ball, we'll get you the ball. You can defend a lot higher up the pitch yeah. and do your business and, and hurt the opposition. That player has to hurt the opposition, whether it's dribbling, getting in the box off the ball, or being a goal scorer and creating things for other, you know, painting pictures for other people, as I call it. Yeah. And um, you know what? It, it, was, it was just an absolute pleasure to play in that, in that position. I loved every minute of it. And we're going to get stuck in over the next hour to what it means to be a great 10 and what attributes you need and so on. Um, look, pre-Premier League, when, when you were playing 10 in those late Spurs days, but let's have a look at you causing some damage, Ooh. Glenn, starting with a 3-1 win over Oxford United. Remember this day? Oh, this this was, was April 1980. Yeah, you was, walked through the whole team. This was my last goal for Tottenham, you know. I was leaving to go to Monaco, and this is my last sort of... I think it was my last goal at White Hart Lane. Yeah, I managed to just get through, and and uh, it was a it, personally, it was a lovely way to just kiss goodbye to the Tottenham fans. It, I always look back on it emotionally, and it was a lovely feeling. But that was, uh, yeah, I was in that position. There was a cross went in, and I was just allowed in that yeah. position. See, you're allowed to not cheat. It's not cheating. If your manager wants you to defend, you got to defend higher up the pitch. But there's times when you just think, right, where's that ball going to drop? I'll just come into pull into little positions mm -hmm. where you become free, and no one can pick you up. And that was a prime example. Yeah, you scored the winner against Nottingham Forest, 1979, mm -hmm. White Hart Lane. Yeah. It's a, 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 so analyze the ten role in this goal for us. Well, this was a little bit different because although Tottenham were a very technical team, this didn't touch the floor. It came from the goalkeeper. But I was a, arriving in the box. That's where you're in that little position. I was out a little bit wide on the right, and I just arrived in the box at the very right moment. And that's what you have to do as well as a 10. You have to mm -hmm. arrive in that penalty area, in and around the penalty area, mm -hmm. and, uh, and get your goals from there. You're never going to be someone that's going to be really tapping them in from six yards, because that's not your job. That's mm -hmm. going to be your main finisher, your strikers. But you have to arrive in the penalty area, and that one fell beautifully for me on yeah. my uh, right foot to volley. Look, you scored a, a classic volley against Manchester United. We're not going to see that one, no. but a goal against Manchester mm -hmm. United around the same sort of time as well. I know a lot of Tottenham fans remember this one. And <laughs> Edge this, of the box. This, yeah, this is an example of a, of a number 10 arriving in and around the D. This is where I was uh, positioned. I come onto it late. So you let the first phase of attackers go in, you let the defenders go in and defend, and you're, I'm screaming at Ricky Villa to cut it back. Mm. And he cuts it back beautifully. And then, you know, you just have the side foot. Sometimes you don't have to blast the football. Yeah. It's coming at you. You use the pace of the ball. And, but that's a number 10 position where you arrive letting everyone go in first, you arrive late. Yeah, we'll have another look at it. It's worth another look, isn't it? But it, it's the timing, yeah? It's the this, timing. This key moment here before VSC. You yeah. see all the United players going in to defend and he just pulls it back beautifully. Lovely weight of pass and I just stroked it, really. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to find the power, really. Uh, if the ball's coming back at you, it's about getting the technique right yeah. and just stroking the ball wide of the keeper. Yeah, so when we talk about international greats, Glenn, uh, and who played in that number 10 position. Who's the first one for, cool. for Mr Hodley springs to mind? Maradona. I know Pele. You're going back way, way, Pele. But Maradona, and in the modern game, you've got, you've got so many. Mm. Zico and Maradona were special players for mm. me. South Americans, which they had number 10s for many, many, many years. Mm. Always, actually. Um, and probably the European teams copied it a little bit as we went through. But, mm. but those were the real genuine number 10s, uh, uh, Maradona's and your Pelé's, uh, that I, that as a kid, being brought up. You know, in, in Europe, you've got to say people like Platini, uh, more modern days, Zidane. But, but for me, um, you know, Cruyff was, an, although he wore the 14, because I think that was a superstition, mm. he was a player that the team was built round. And this is what the number 10s on, on the continent, teams were, were built round yeah. the number 10. Cruyff was an incredible footballer. What Cruyff had was this, this ability to run the game. Mm -hmm. from that position. Mm. So they were, they were the real number 10s to me. Zico was a fabulous player. Yeah. Should have probably done, you know, in 82, they had a wonderful Brazil side, should have won the World Cup, didn't. Mm. And probably should have played for a better team in, in Italy as mm -hmm. well. But for me, when I see a number 10, you could learn so much from him. Yeah, oh, look, Maradona was the first name that you said, and obviously, you mm. know, you were playing at similar times. So could, could you sense and feel the hype of what was happening, particularly when he was at Napoli? Oh, yeah, I mean, at Napoli, he was, he was untouchable, unplayable. I think he was set above everyone else that's ever played at football mm. on, on the planet, to be honest. Mm. I watched him very closely. I was in Monaco at the time. We nearly crossed over. I nearly went to Napoli a year before he went. So whether 
ever we'd have ever played together. Imagine we that. played together Ronald in Aussies. and Maradona. Yeah, yes, we, please. We actually played at White Hart Lane together in Aussie's testimonial, which was a fantastic opportunity. But for me, he was just a, an absolute genius. Yeah. And um, but he was a bit more than a, just a number ten. He, he was a striker that really, a little bit like the modern day Messi. Mm. Go where you want. You're a number 10, but go where you want. Mm. You can go anywhere on the football pitch to just get the ball and change the game. And that's mm. what Maradona and the great players had. And Messi 30 years before Messi. And Me Messi was, a, was mm. a, for me, Argentinian again as well. Yeah. Amazing, really, how close they are, left-footed. But he's, he's the one as well. You go, go and play anywhere. Just mm. get him the ball. Give the ball to him. Mm -hmm. Whether he would go wide left, wide right, in behind, up front. Just let him have the ball. And that's what the number 10s are about. Yeah. Plenty of the ball. Yeah, a little bit later than Maradona, but obviously Roberto Baggio, mm. Alessandro Del Piero, yeah. uh, doing what they did in, in Serie A, six league titles, and uh, yeah. again, different to Maradona. Different style, that's the difference, Will, is that, that for me, there's, there's different styles of the 10. There's semi-striker 10s, mm. you know, like a Baggio is just more of a striker coming off, and, and, and the likes of Teddy Sheringham, maybe, if you like, and, and, and your Burkamps and your Zolas, who we'll look at a bit later. Those sort of players, they're, they're, then you've got a Platini and a Cruyff, who you think, well, actually, Zidane, they're more sort of midfield mm. creators that play in the 10. The one thing the 10 has to do, he has to be a creator and he has to score goals yeah. to be a real genuine number 10. Yeah. And all them players we're talking about were. And then I think there's a third element to it as well, really, in many ways, is there's like a what I call a box number 10. Yeah. Somebody that's not really the creator, and that's coming maybe a bit more into the modern game, just somebody yeah. that gets into the box, waits for holes to be, arrive, and arrives in the yeah. penalty area and scores goals. Uh, I mean, out of those names, and we're just flashing, I could just, I could just spend the next 45 minutes just throwing names at you. Could, yeah, uh, you Ronaldinho, could. Yeah. Iniesta, oh. Zidane, you know, all completely different types, but the sort of the most traditional 10 out of those names that you've mentioned in terms of the international greats would be? when it sort of springs to mind. The first name you said was a Maradona, Maradona. but he's so unorthodox, isn't he? He was a one-off, yeah, he was a one-off. I think Zidane in the modern game, in the modernish game, I think Zidane would be one mm. that I would say... He's an artist as well on the football mm. pitch, Zidane. Yeah. Again, you go and watch, you'd pay money to go and watch him play. Yeah. You know, there's so many, isn't there? Ronaldinho at his very best. Um, but it's a one. Where does Pele fit into this? Well, Pele, of course, was the, the genuine, the first number 10. Mm. And the Brazilians played with that. Greatest player of all time? Um, I, can't, <laughs> I can't go further than that. I think technically Maradona was the best yeah. uh, technical I've ever seen. Some of the goals that he scored and whatever. But I didn't really see enough. I've seen Pelé in clips on, on television, didn't see him play. Mm. Obviously played with Maradona and played against him in, in the hand of God goal and uh, the, the, the magical goal that he scored against in the Azteca in 86. But yeah. So for me, that's why I've always gone towards Maradona, really. Yeah. Uh, right, now we've examined some of the uh, international greats of the position. Let's hear what a few of our current Premier League players I think makes an ideal number 10. Making assists, making uh, good passes, um, change games and everything. And of course, just uh, quality of an offensive players, like scoring goals, set pieces. Technically good with the ball and um, yeah, good eyes for the right pass. Intelligence. Um, technique, cleverness, um, being able to find spaces, especially when you're in, in that pocket. Technical ability, I would say vision, um, you know, vision, spatial awareness. Good number 10, I'd say, playing on a half turn mainly. Um, me being a striker, I'd love, I love when a player in front of me just gets on a half turn and slips me on or whatever. So I think, um, yeah, especially playing on a half turn and um, yeah, just vision really. I think someone who can obviously read the game, who's in between the lines, who doesn't have to be fast in particular, but who can just play between the lines and is obviously uh, a good passer as well. Special technique, special technique that you have a feeling he's not only a football player, he's like he's dancing with the ball, like Ronaldinho and everything. Knowing what's around you, having the awareness to know what to do and, and having that quality. I feel like look, the tens are an important position. It's having that quality, I've been able to do some of that, change the game. And um, I'd say like, the top tens in the Prem, you've got these, these David Silva, you people like that, they're, they're the ones that had all of that. Being smart, you've got to be really smart in that position. You know? And uh, yeah, I would say the main thing would probably be technical ability and, and vision. 
So making space for yourself, mm. creating space, vision, making things happen in the game. What yeah. would Glenn's um, sort of key points well, to being a 10 attribute wise, technique wise? Be? The guys have covered a lot of it. Most of it. The number one asset for me is your total awareness. Mm. You've got to be a 10 will see things on a football pitch. Nobody else sees. So the vision and the awareness of knowing where you are compared to where your defenders are, where you're first and foremost, and then where your teammates are. Mm. So you have to have that 360 degrees awareness. Mm. And that's when somebody was saying on the half term, well, that's a part of the 360 degrees. Mm. So that you can, you can, and technically then you have to, if you can be off two feet, that's even better. Most of the tens are quite two footed. Yeah. You know, so they're playing in the 360 degrees uh, ratio. So you can pick out, you know, they'll do things where people go, how did he do that? You know, when we see these players, how did he, how did he see that pass, let alone make that pass? And they're the, they're the things that, people love to see on a football game they're the things that stand out the special things you've got to have that you know that ability that vision and that confidence to do it you have to be strong minded mm -hmm. people haven't said about the mind because if you're the most imp and abroad it was the most important position mm. the onus the pressure was on you to perform now don't forget you're back the quarterback the, aren't you you know you're the sense. quarterback in a way yeah but also don't forget not so much nowadays you were man marked the number 10 was man marked yeah so somebody could follow you pull your shirt a couple of times kick you and not get booked whereas now in this day in this era you can't do that yeah so the space is there a little bit in english football the spaces were there mm -hmm. for players to go into the number 10 positions abroad it was different that number that the hardest player the toughest defender would be put up against you mm. that's why maradona for me goes above everyone else yeah because sometimes they had to put two men on him and they couldn't get near him so that 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 just shows you how important, how difficult that is. Mm. What the guys have just said in that in that uh, VT there, multitude of things, awareness, first touch, you know, uh, half turn, all them things. There's six or seven things that are massive. You don't ask a fullback or a centre back to do that, do you? Yeah. Even a striker sometimes. You wait in, in that box and score the goals. But the number ten has to have array of so much talent and awareness about them mm. as well as in the modern day fit into the defensive side a little bit as well yeah and this is why i get back to uh, how we distrusted that sort of player many many moons ago from the 70s right the way through the, to the 80s we actually got stuck playing 442 for so so long that put us behind lots of these teams. We talked about international greats as, mm. as a 10, but someone that you worked with in Sir Alex Ferguson had the pleasure of working with, a player that had wing mirrors on, basically, was, yeah. was Paul Scholes. And you yeah. talk about that 360 degree yeah. vision and you played him as the 10 when you were England manager. We played, we had a system that, um, that you know, having experienced that as a player, playing against it, uh, I love the number 10, even down to when I went into management at Swindon and Chelsea, I bought Gavin Peacock at Chelsea and little Martin Ling played it for me. So when I went to England, I was going to, where's my number 10? Mm. And Paul Scholes was absolutely ideal because he was a half striker, half midfield player. Mm -hmm. So he actually was perfect to play that role. Yeah. And he, he proved that because he could play up front as a second striker. And in the end, he played as a deep line midfield player at the end of his career. But, he, it, but when he was in his pomp, he had this cleverness, as you say, the wing mirror the awareness he could slide people in uh, could score goals that's the assets you've got to be a goal scorer to have that position mm. deemed upon you you've got to be a scorer of goals and you've got to create and Paul had that in abundance how do you coach a 10 with with talent like that I mean obviously he was being coached by Sir Alex and the Manchester United Ten. coaches and he sort of came in and you sprinkled bits on top of him as well you know what 10's 10's probably you're either a 10 or you're not it's very difficult to coach a 10. What you might give them, you might assess a couple of games where you might tell them, oh, you can pick up, you can pick up little spaces better than you have done in the last couple of games, but you're not really going to be able to coach them as such. Mm. You know, you, you, there's, there's little reminders of positions and things when the ball goes wide, we do need you on the edge of the box. Mm. Uh, whoever it is, you know, you do need to get in the box at times. You may be holding out a little bit. There's little things like that, but you actually don't. They're natural players. The mm. tens are tens because they play the game virtually off the cuff, mm. like nobody else does on the football pitch. And this is where it's changed, thankfully, over the years. You know, we've, we've got now in England, we've, we've got a little bit more of open mindedness about these type of players. We never used to trust them. But uh, they, they, they're the ones that, uh, they're the ones with the natural talent. If only we'd, we'd seen it earlier, England would have won more World Cups, Glenn, for well, 66, I think, wouldn't I they? I think we could have done. <laughs> but this is what the, see, listen, Germany, 
Germans were the ones that lost in 66, yeah. and they reinvented themselves in 70. And at the end of the day, they dictated everything through the 70s. What did we do in the 70s? We didn't qualify for any, yeah. for any tournaments. Good old 442 long 4 ball. 442, and we got stuck that way. We were lazy in our coaching for many, many years, and we suffered for it. Thankfully, mm. it all changed, um, and the, 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 the academies started to... To, to, to change the way that we brought these kids through. And we've got a ton of them now. Mm. We've got loads of them, which we'll come to later. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's one of those scenarios. We needed to change them when they were eight, nine, ten years of age. Yeah, absolutely. Right, time for a short break. When we come back, we are going to be uh, analysing the different types of number tens that are around and that we've seen during the Premier League era. And Glenn will let us know who he thinks embodies the best of each of those. Welcome back to The Art Of, the number 10 with the great man, Mr. Glenn Hoddle. And we're going to split what a number 10 is into three categories, Glenn, aren't we? And the first one being the striker dropping in as a 10. So yeah. just explain, you've got the tactics board out. What do you mean by that? got the board here, yeah. I mean, as I said before, there's, there's different styles of 10s. This is a, this is a 10 that would, would, would go and get marked mm. and, and, and drop in. So you drop into the spaces from a, a position where you're a striker, that if the ball does go over the top, you're happy to do that. You're happy to sink in with your partner if, you, if your partner's up there with you or, or one just in behind. But it's about coming off into these spaces, into these positions, uh, when the ball's in, in different positions here. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're finding these holes, you're drifting in, in, if it's the other way around on the other side of the pitch, you go and get marked and you drift off, off the side of the, so you're coming off on an angle. What's important here as well, is when the ball's on, on, the, on the right hand side, for instance here, as a, an example, yeah. if you come off on the side of the ball, the defender will come in behind you and mark you very tightly. But the beauty of coming off as a number 10 is go and get marked, come off on the opposite side of the pitch, when the ball is being played in and it's coming across, now it ball comes into there, this defender won't come and mark you. Yeah. And if he does, he'll come late, and if he does, he leaves a massive hole there. So at the end of the day, you win both ways round. Now, we had to do that a little bit, although he's not number 10, with Michael Owen, when I had Shearer and, and Michael Owen up front, I needed a, to, some players to drop into them spells, into them little spaces, yeah. and we did it with Michael Owen, and he did it brilliantly, yeah. particularly in that goal against Argentina. Yeah. It was a great example of that, um, where he, he just drops in into this position. I think it's David Beckham on the right-hand side, mm -hmm. and we worked at that. And then he, the rest is history. He goes on that run. But that's such an important position, whether you're playing with two strikers, one of them dropping in. And, and Teddy Sheringham, for instance, was an absolute master at that. Yeah. He really was. And, and a lot of people learnt from Teddy playing yeah. in that position. You've picked out some examples, Glenn, haven't you, from Teddy Sheringham? Should we have a look mm. at those and, and yeah. talk us through some of these? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, this, straight away, you'll see here, he's pinning people down here, but he's, he's a linker in and around the D. That's him, but this is where he's at his very, very best for me. Look, the position he's in there now, he's just in, in space in behind. What a beautiful little clip. Number 10 always needs pictures ahead of you. You always need movement ahead of you if you've got that ability. Here's a little uh, one-two here, little Scolzi. Clever players, players that see, you know, what we were talking about, the awareness. But again, he's come off his defenders there, and now he's prepared to get in and around the edge of the D, in and around the box. And that's what you need from your 10. You know, again, he's come off. There's no one marking him. He's already got in that position. Before that move happens, Will, mm. he's already had a look over his shoulder. He's looked at where the defenders are and he's, he's got himself in the space. Mm -hmm. He knows where he is, where he can turn and hit his shot. And that's what a, a, a really good 10, especially if you're a striker 10 mm -hmm. coming off, needs to, that... 360 degrees example that I was talking about. And how nice was that for you? Because obviously you coached Teddy with England, but with, yeah. with Spurs as well, and he was a master at that. Oh, he was. He was. He was somebody that young, youngsters could teach that. And Teddy did that particularly well, coming off when he was on the opposite side of the ball. Mm. And everyone used to say, how does he get his space? It was quite, it was quite simple, yeah. really. But if you come off on the side of the ball as a number 10, you're going to get marked. He used to drift into areas thinking you're not involved, and suddenly... One pass, two passes, and Teddy would be in space. Yeah. And I think the likes of other players, younger players coming through, learnt a lot from yeah. that. So strong in the air, Teddy Sheringham, but so strong on the ground, that sort of centre of gravity, yeah. using his backside to just get out of positions and hold up play is so important, isn't it? Well, it, 
he had he had a bit of both. That's why he was the striker come number ten, drifting mm. in there. He had that opportunity, that ability to hold the ball up, as we saw in the first clip there. Mm. And also for me, great header of the ball. Yeah. And he would arrive in the penalty area again. Let the first phase of defence, let the first phase of attack go in, and Teddy would then arrive in that penalty spot area and get right in there and score goals with his head yeah. as well as his left and right foot. He was a two-footed player as well. So he had everything. He had everything to play the number 10 role. So type two, in terms of what makes a number 10, creative midfielders yeah. with an eye for goal. Let's go back to the tactics board. Explain this one for us. Yeah, I mean, this one is pretty a little bit deeper. I mean, mm. you would say your Platini's would be that sort of player. Years ago, Cruyff and, and the ones we've got nowadays play in this position just in front of two, two defenders there. And they would look to play what I call across the arc. So you'd allow them to play right across the arc there, in behind, and make sure they're on the outsides. Sometimes, you know, Will, the worst place to go and play mm. is in the number 10 position. You get picked up. So what you would do is you would go and get marked out on, the, uh, on a winger, yeah. uh, sorry, on a, as a winger, and get, as a fullback, and drift in. Ah. So you're always on the shoulder of the, the, the last deep defender in midfield. So again, you'd be out here if the ball's, you're allowing him to play across what I call the arc and go and get marked at times and come off. But realistically, it's a bit deeper. And then what you'll do, you'll find this player will be able to hit passes. It'll hurt you from a deeper position. Mm -hmm. With ex the example of Teddy was higher up the pitch. This lad, whoever it is, and there's different styles, can come deep, get turned, play a ball across the field, and then arrive in the penalty area later. Yeah. He's more of a, a midfield creator somebody that they can pass the ball into, um, sorry, where's the ball? We can pass the ball into him with, into feet and he'll get turned. And whether he slides people in and creates or he runs at people. You know, if you've got ability like Hazard had that ability mm. in that position to run at people. So that is, that is a very, very shrewd player that can go and just pick up positions all the way across the pitch and be what I call the quarterback. Yeah. That's more of a quarterback, yeah, yeah, yeah. where yeah. everything goes through. Dennis Burkamp, a good example. Burkamp was like that. Yeah. Zola was like that. Mm. And, uh, and Platini definitely going back was yeah. that sort of player in Cruyff. But, um, but Dennis, Dennis was, was a superb player. Look, the vision, look at that. Look at that for a pass, change of play. And he, Vieira doesn't have to touch the ball. It's perfect, the weight of pass, a one touch. Look at that. Players don't need to take a touch because that number 10, look at the position he's picked up. That little in between the centre backs don't come out. This is sublime. This you cannot, you cannot teach that. You just cannot teach that. But that's what Dennis had. He arrived in the penalty area that time. Yeah, like Teddy earlier there, had a quick look, come off the defenders into that little pocket. And this goal, well, he sets the pass up, like I've just said, coming in a deep position like a quarterback plays the ball out, why, where is he? Look at his desire to get in the box. And this is incredible finishing <laughs> and strength. You know, that's also, number 10, you always think like, you see how he pushed the defender off, the strength that he showed, mm. not only mentally to get in the box, but physically, you have to be, you have to look after yourself in that position. Yeah, yeah. Dennis was one that could look after himself, believe and me. That goal against Newcastle, it, oh. I mean, it's one of the greatest Premier League goals of all time, isn't it? Incredible. But, uh, the fact that he sets it up, as you say, on the halfway line just makes it even better. Exactly. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you play a pass like that and sometimes you're happy just to make the pass. Yeah, yeah. A lot of players would be happy, not Dennis. He's gone in the box and the sublime bit of skill yeah. was, was incredible in the finish. Another an example of that then, and interesting that you, you explained it with the arc, would probably be a, a Gianfranco Zola. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them players would, would, would be... Uh, a, with Zola, he had, he, had forward, he had forward instincts as a striker because he, was gr he, grown, he grew up in Napoli, playing for Napoli with Maradona mm. as a youngster coming through. So he saw, but this is him in, in the box. He was somebody for so small, it was brave on the ball to get in the penalty area and to make runs in behind defenders. But he would also play that creative role deeper. But once he had you on toast, as I call it, once you, fa you faced up against <laughs> you, you he had you because he was his trickery and his movement of the ball and the feet. He's such a quick thinker. It was quite incredible. Look there, he shifted the ball so quickly and he's got the techniques to finish. Here you see him. Look, he's running in behind defenders and that is just, again, sublime. You cannot coach that. 
That is just somebody, look at a big smile, enjoying the game, and probably thousands of people watching that number 10 yeah. do his business. It helps when your number 10 smiles as well, because you should be enjoying <laughs> it, doesn't it? Because I know you said at the top of the show that you know, it's maybe not necessarily the most fashionable position, because kids want to play striker, don't they? And they mm. want to score their goals. Mm. But, but it's, it's sort of fashionable with those who have the talent, because you need the skill to be able to play. And Zola was a, a fine example. Oh, but he could overlap in a lot of these categories, couldn't he? He could. He could. He had a bit of everything, you mm. know, as we've just shown there. He had, at times, he could come deep and hit 40, 60, 50 yard passes mm. over the back of defenders, you know, and then he, he could dribble. He could a little bit like had a bit of hazard in him where you get turned in that little pocket in that 10 position and run at people and shift people. And put, he, put, he put people off balance, defenders off balance. Yeah. He had such good balance, he put them off balance. And then suddenly he could slide someone in or, or put it in the top corner. Yeah. He was, a, he was an artist. What are your memories then of, of that arc? Because the way you explained it, you know, mm. just drifting out wide, you create the space, you come yeah. into it. I mean, that was a trick of yours at Spurs at White Hart Lane, many occasions, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I found that you had, to, you had to be astute enough to pick them positions up. And sometimes, as I said, the last place you want to be is in that number 10 position. We mm. all think of number 10 in behind the striker, mm -hmm. in behind two strikers, maybe back in the day. But you needed to arrive in that position rather than stand in that position. Yeah. And I think that's where you can help as a A coach. nine can stand in the position if yeah. you can't, yeah? Exactly, because he'll occup occupy a couple of defenders. Whereas I think sometimes, you know, youngsters, you can teach them to maybe... They've got the talent to be a number 10, but they might mm -hmm. need a bit of guidance, not mm -hmm. coaching as such, a bit of guidance on where to drift in and drift into them positions at the right time. Mm -hmm. Football's all about being in a good position or a bad position related to the football. Mm -hmm. Where the football is on the football pitch, you have to be in the right position, whether you're a defender or certainly a number 10. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're forever having to think about what if, what if that I get that ball in that position? What if, if I drift into those positions and I receive the ball, then I can do my business. Yeah. So you're always thinking two or three passes ahead of the game. That is another thing that a good number 10 has to have. That vision is one thing. We talk about vision as when the ball's at his feet mm. and what he sees. But he's Teddy, Sheringham, Zola, Burkham, all them players we've just shown. They are three, two or three passes ahead. The snooker players, aren't getting they? Getting in their positions mm. to then go and hurt the opposition. Yeah. Um, so the third type, then, is the, uh, the box threat, as you call yeah. it, number 10, who arrives from deeper. So when we look yeah. at the pitch, what, explain what you mean by that, Glenn. Well, that would be nine times out of ten. It's when the ball's uh, uh, progressed up the pitch and it's in a little bit of a wider position and you're looking and you're waiting. Deli Ali had that gift at his very best a few seasons ago where your striker makes movement and you're looking then to hit the box, what I call, they hit the box off the ball. They're not going to be the ones that create, they're not going to be the ones that run and dribble and go past people. They're waiting for holes to develop mm -hmm. and then they get into that penalty area and they're a finisher. They finish, so that's a number 10 that is, is, is a slightly different, not as creative maybe, but as, a, as a effective and probably might actually score a lot of goals in that mm. position. You're going back, there's a, there's a crossover, you know, Will, between some eights that are like that. Yeah. I was so De Bruyne was an eight and a ten. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I think, you know, Deli Ali definitely at his pomp for Tottenham was just in behind Harry Kane and he made them lovely runs and he played again in, mm. just in round the D at times. That's where you had to pick up them positions in this sort of area around here. Mm. And, and eventually, a lot of his goals were waiting for them holes to, and, and making those timed runs. You yeah. have to time it right. If you go in too early, at times when he was younger, he went in too early, the ball wasn't ready to come. Mm -hmm. Then it, if you're too late, you're going to miss your opportunity. Yeah. So it's very interesting. That's a different style of number 10, getting and timing it to relate it to when the ball's going to be crossed or played in to mm. those positions. And exhibit A, as you said, was, was Deli Ali in his prime, Glenn, mm. wasn't he? Yeah, very much so. Look at him getting forward. You know, he, he had the... F uh, I think with Deli, he had a freedom. You look at him here, he had a freedom in his mind. Look, come off in that position. Wasn't in that position. Came off a, a marker to come in there and slide Son in. And then when the ball's out wide here, he's in the box. This is a, this is a wonderful, this is probably his best goal I've seen him. He's in that position again. It's amazing how many times you, you see that position where the defenders are all gone in and attackers. This is him, this is where I think he's at his best. Making those runs in behind a striker, getting into the box. That is what I saw Deli Ali at his very best. Making those, look, again, he's in these positions where he's just pointing where he wants the ball. And that was when he was at his very, very best. Cool finisher. 
And this time, you know, he's in that, in the, this is a wonderful finish as well. Goes for the overlap, clever, yeah. comes back into that number 10 position, if you like, and puts in a wonderful strike. This is him at his very best. What a great run, what a great ball that was. But it was waiting for those moments where defenders are just caught out of position and there's a space and a hole there to go into. Yeah, and it's so aggressive, isn't it? You see there, he was looking for that overlap but came in. Yeah. It's always front foot, you're always looking to push, push, push. You can only do that in a certain type of team, can't you? Yeah, I mean, it's no good having a number... This is why I find it hard. There was no position for me as a number 10 because when the ball's played long, mm. when the ball goes from back to front, which it did a lot in the 80s, mm. it was very difficult to play in those positions. Mm. A good number 10 in a good team that plays good football, mm. attractive, you know, shorter passes maybe, technical players behind him as well, to find you. It's all right being a number 10 in good positions. If you don't get the ball, you're not going to do the business. You're not going to hurt the opposition. Yeah. So you've got to be in a team that actually can feed the number 10. But as I say, it's changed. It's a bit easier for the 10s now. Yeah. Your Messi's compared to your Maradona's. Maradona had somebody following him, kicking yeah. him. And they could kick him back in the day. Yeah. Messi and your Ronaldo's and the modern day player, they don't have that anymore. Mm. Thankfully, because it's helped the game. It's a creative mm -hmm. game. So these, these guys have got the freedom of the park. Yeah, perfect. Right, that's all we've got time for in part two. But join us after the break as we look at the development of the modern day number 10 and also what the future might look like for that position. See you in three minutes. Welcome back to The Art Of. We're talking, of course, about the number 10 with Glenn Hoddle in the studio with me. Um, so we're talking about the modern number 10 mm. now. And how, Glenn, do you think that that role has evolved over the last decade? It has changed a little bit in the modern day. You, they play... The 10s play on the wide berth a little bit and then they, are, they come inside and, and it's now the full-backs, whether it's wing-backs or whether it's in a back four, the left and right back, they're the ones that give you the width and the height mm. um, in most teams nowadays. So it's that little position that they're having to defend mm. but they're having to then come in in those little what are called pockets. Mm -hmm. Sometimes nowadays there's two number 10s. Man City have more than two, by the way, but at the end of the day... That's, that's the little number 10s that we're talking about, yeah. really. And I think it's interesting that we've got a batch of these coming through in England now. And I think it was because back in... When they were probably 8, 9, 10, a few years back now, probably mm. 12 years ago, we changed the academies. We changed the way that we brought these kids up. Mm. We, were, we had two bigger pitches, less touches of the ball, and now we suddenly changed it. Went a little bit more like the Continental yeah. side teams and, 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 and the... Uh, the template for them, and they have more touches of the ball, yeah. smaller pitches. So instead of getting like, smaller people, I mean, like, you're a big guy, Glenn. Exactly. You, I, mean, I know Maradona wasn't, yeah. but you know, but the tens now could be quite diminutive figures. Can't well, they? why not? The pitches are so good now. Back in the day, it was when the, the pitches were poor mm. that you had to have an athlete, strong, big, six footers were better if they were technically good. Mm. You had the strength as well. Nowadays, you don't need that. You know, the lower gravity you are, the mm. better, the quicker footed you are, because the pitches are beautiful and the rules have changed. Mm. You can't be touched now, hardly, yeah. as a creative player. But these guys that we had in England have changed the way, when they were 8, 9, 10, the way they were coached, mm. the way we brought them up. What's happened? They're now 21, 22. They're the ones that are coming through, you, you know, like your, your Foden's and your Madison's and your Mounts. Mm. Players like this, technically gifted now, that we changed. And thank God we did change yeah. way back then. And it's the fruits of that is coming through now in the, in the English game. And credit to Frank Lampard for giving Mason Mount a go yeah. because, you know, he had him at Derby on loan, didn't yeah. he? And then gave him that chance in the Premier League. He's never looked back, has he, he Mason Mount? He's never looked back. He owes Frank a hell of a lot. He really does. And Frank believed in him, and rightly so, because he saw the talent that we all hadn't seen yet. But he was working with him. But these, these are wonderful player positions. Look, he's, again, it's coming into the number 10. Look at that little pocket in there that he's trying to pick the ball. Now the ball's, now that he's tight, he's, picked, he's, mic, he's been marked and picked up. So what does he do? He makes a little blindside run. And this is him here. Look how just, wide he is, Glenn. Man. I know, this yeah. is where the, the ten has changed. They're wide, and this he puts in a perfect cross there for Havertz to, to score against Wolves, I think, last weekend. This is wonderful play. Again, he's got a little bit of running at people. He can run with the ball and create the space and, and cover the ground. Look, checks out, clever to come behind the ball. That's, a, that's just the astuteness of a number 10. Not only that pass, but his astuteness to come behind the ball so he actually creates space for himself. You get marked easier if you're ahead of the ball. Again, here, stays behind the ball, 
lovely little tuck in and again you have to be a finisher if you're going to be a number 10 and uh, this this is a think against West Ham and he ends up this is a wonderful look he goes into the box drifts into the box doesn't try and, most people will try and hit that with the laces he's hit that with the inside of his foot so he's the confidence in his technique and he is a very very good modern day number 10. Mm. I'd love to have a stepometer on Mason Mount because he, he puts in his miles doesn't he? Well he does he works as well and I think that's the modern day 10. Yeah. They always work you had to work but you had to work maybe higher up the pitch. It's those little steps though isn't it everywhere it's exactly. not necessarily the big strides. No he's, he's, he's working all the time defensively for his team as well mm. he's a very he understands these guys understand the defensive side mm. uh, of the game as well whereas mm. maybe back in the day it was if you're a half like we spoke about half striker coming off you didn't have to worry too much about the yeah. defensive side yeah and like we talked earlier about being in a front foot team you know mm. Chelsea have been an aggressive team it's maybe easier to be a 10 in a Chelsea team that is for Leicester so I mean credit to someone like James Madison absolutely who, who has been ripping up trees in that position I, I love this fella I think if he was playing no disrespect to Leicester look at that for a pass look at that for a pass I mean, if this kid can't get in the England team, we must have a very good England team. <laughs> because he's a, he's, a, he's a talent. And when he's playing at his best, look, left foot, right foot, doesn't matter. Uh, he picks up again like the art I'm talking about. He's out in wide positions, but he can come in and hurt. But here, even if it's wide here, mm. you think he's got no options. Look at that for a pass. Suddenly, like I said about the number 10, they're seeing things that no one else on the football pitch can see yeah and that was a prime example again you've got to get in the box you've got to be a finisher and have that cool head oh. that's beautiful that's that's you know that's look at this for a finish class. Glenn remember this one Drink yeah I do this was this was a, again out on that left hand side coming inside there's the space don't close him down at your peril because you can do that and again what we haven't spoke about actually Will is most number 10s are free kick specialists. Just what I was about to ask you. To be the complete 10, do yeah. you then have to have that in your pocket? I think you've got to have that in your locker, yeah. yeah. Most of them actually have, when you think about them all the way through. Mm. You know, again, I'll go back to Maradona. So you, I think if you watch his free kicks, they're, un, they're unreal. But yeah. all the number 10s really have, have got that in their locker, yeah. uh, which we didn't touch on earlier, but it just came up there with Madison. Yeah. It's a beautiful one. Well, there you go. But that, that's another show, isn't it? Goats, the Goats 10. That's yeah. a whole different uh, yeah. ball game. Um, so, like, Phil Foden, someone else that you're yeah. hugely impressed with the whole time that he's been in the Premier League under, under Pep Guardiola, who, who, again, brought him through the academy and gave him his chance. He did, and he was patient with him. Pep, Pep was fantastic patient with him. Again, number 10 position that we get. He has to go a little bit wider in this city, team because City have got probably three or four number 10s at times. But this kid's got ability. Uh, you know, again, he's happy to be wide. He's happy to to come in these positions, he gets in, you know, he's got the little turn of pace that he can get in behind, look, and he, he arrives in the penalty area, probably more so for City because he knows the build-up is going to be different. Mm. So he's got that in his locker, that little six-yard finish, uh, as well as, like, his, his runs off the ball are as good as anyone, mm. actually. Look, he's, he's a clever player, he knows where to pick up. For me, he, he's got all this for City. For me, I think he can play in the number 10 position for England. Mm. I think the arc that I'm talking about, he can certainly play wide. He knows how to play left and right. I think if you give him that licence to play across the arc, mm. he gets in the box. He, he, he ticks every single box for me, Foden. Yeah. And uh, I just hope that he can do that and get, be given the chance at England level yeah. to produce what we're seeing for City. So how does the phrase false nine fit into this equation? Because I remember a game where he was so dominant, mm. um, Phil Foden, at Anfield. And Manchester City won at Liverpool. But afterwards, Pep Guardiola said, yeah, he doesn't quite know how to play there yet. He'll learn. You know, if that's someone who doesn't yeah. know how to play there yet, yeah. he's got a very bright future, isn't he, yeah, when he's I in his 30s? I remember. That, I remember that game because he did show so much advanced astuteness really to play that role. Mm. Pep was probably looking at where he can take it, mm. perfection in many ways. So that's a number 10 without, without a nine? Without a nine. Yeah. I mean, that's where, if you've not got a nine, that's where Pep was, was clever. Other clubs have tried it, they're nowhere near as good a city at doing it, where you've, you end up with two or three. Maybe, you know, two or three number 10s. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not really number 9s. They all like to come and get the ball to feet. They prefer, probably, mm -hmm. to have a number 9, which now City have got yeah. in Haaland. But, you know, Kane does that for England. He can do that. And, and I think, you know, that you need someone to, to, to hit. Mm. They need that striker ahead of them, in my opinion, to have the balance of it right. Yeah. Um, and now, 
you're seeing what Haaland's given Man City another dimension. So I think, you know, for England and from a lot of teams, you know, Madison we talk about, he had Vardy at his best mm. when they were at their very best, the pair of them. And uh, Dele Alli and, and Kane had that. Mount had the centre forwards he's worked with at, at mm. Chelsea, a lot of top quality. For, and I think they're the, that, that's what you need. That's when it's working at its very, very best. When yeah. you're seeing the pictures and you've got somebody that can hit those pictures and hit that movement yeah. that, uh, that's been given them. And I think Foden can do that. So what needs to happen for Foden to be that 10 then, to unlock this future England success that you can uh, see in your crystal ball? He needs to be given that position. Mm. He needs to be Just given simple that. Just play him then. Yeah, I think that's one thing we don't do in England that they do abroad. That we, we don't make a special player. We're scared to, at a young age, identify. Rooney would have been one. Mm -hmm. as, as good as Rooney was, for England and whatever, but he needed maybe, and, and some certain players need to be identified. They're going to be special players. Mm. Make them special. Make them think special. Yeah. Let them go to games with the England manager at a weekend when they're injured and talk and, and understand the game and mm. bring them on. And I think Foden was one of them. I saw him at 17 and said the kid's more South American mm. than the South Americans he was playing against. Mm -hmm. But he, what he had as well, he had this very clever mind. Mm. But he's now playing at the perfect club as well. Yeah. So for me, Foden is one in four or five years' time, could be, if he's given the reins, could be one of the best players in the world. Yeah. So quick fire questions for you. Oh dear. Some of them could be quick fire, some of them could be, could right. be slower. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and before we even get to that, I was going to ask you, because at the top of the show, I mentioned the word Messi to you. So what would, uh, what would a Messi be? What would a Salah be? Are they just in brackets of their own because they amalgamate quite a few different positions? Yeah, they're, they're, your Messi's and your Maradona's, what we said, and, and, and Salah, you know, they, they, they might start out on the, the wide berth, but they end up centre-forwards, they end up in the 10. It's about giving those players the ball. Mm. Get them on the ball any which way you can get them on the ball. You know, even back in the days when Clough had a... Brian Clough used to say, you're not good enough, but give him the ball. He, <laughs> he can't tackle, he'll do your tackling for you. That's the balance of a team. Yeah. A number 10 and a Messi or a Maradona or a special... If you've got a special player, yeah. get him the ball. At City, Foden, for me, would get the ball, I don't know, 150 times in a game, whereas for England, maybe he's getting mm. it 25 times mm -hmm. in, in the progressive areas. So... Give these players the ball, especially in this day and age. They're not being marked man for man, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a challenge to a number 10. I had yeah. to face that when I went to Monaco. I'd never have done it in England, yeah. but it was a challenge that I wanted. So nowadays, those pockets, are, they're already there. Sometimes you don't even have to create them for yourself. So, yeah. you know, that's why this, this number 10, these positions are so, so important in the modern in the modern game. And it feels like the numbers have merged, doesn't it? Because when we talk yeah. about Harry Kane, everyone calls him a, a nine and a half now. But Kevin De Bruyne, a name you mentioned earlier. Yeah. By the way, we haven't even said the words David Silva, which is yeah. probably a crime, isn't it, when we're talking about number 10s. Kevin De Bruyne, it, City fans would say that he can play eight and ten in eight the game, in the same 90 minutes. Absolutely, yeah. And I think City have got three or four of them. Foden can do that. De Bruyne does it. Bernard, Bernard of Silva does yeah. it. Even they've played Gundogan in that position sometimes when Rodri played. So City, have, uh, they're a little bit of a one-off team at the moment. Mm. England have got a lot of players that can play in, uh, players in that. Even Grealish could play in there, mm -hmm. actually. Did it a few times for Villa. You know, you've got other styles of players, but for, for me, Madison is somebody that I feel mm. Would have, would have been in that England team. But, you know, so we've got an abundance. Fortunately, we've suddenly got an abundance of these lovely sort of number 10 players, yeah. which we didn't have back in the day. We really didn't. Yeah, and look, do you like it then, just finally before we get to these quick fires, that you have these players that can all play 10 or, do, or should it be that specific role that you were in those emerging Spurs days, you know, that quarterback, the, the way you described it? Yeah, I, I think the game has evolved. It's gone on and I think it's, it's now you can afford to have two of them 10s in there from the system that people play mm. because they're mainly now playing with one up that's why it was it was difficult in england at that level with we had shearer and and uh, and, and owen mm. in the end as my front two exciting but mm. we had to do little work with them to come off because we had to fit scolzi in behind yeah so that was a test as a coach to get that balance right if you get it wrong well that's where the argentina goal was born as we touched on earlier yeah with michael yes yeah. of course but you know to have that a much offensive play on the pitch you have to get the defensive side sorted yeah. out they will chip in and these modern day number 10s chip in, they defend. Yeah. And sometimes I think Foden would be better played central because he could just 
lock on to the deeper player for the opponents. Yeah. Right, let's rattle through a few of these. Okay, yeah. first up, uh, what's the most important, the most important <laughs> attribute of a number 10? We touched on loads early, but the most. Uh, there's too many. There's not just one, but you've got to have awareness. You've got to have a know. You've got to be, know where everyone is on the pitch as you receive the ball. Um, who, in your opinion, is the best ever number ten, Mr. Hoddle? Maradona, without a doubt. Diego Maradona. Best no player, hesitation there at best all. Best player of, uh, that's ever hit the planet, technically, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when Diego Maradona died, um, a tweet that went out from from you, Glenn, a lovely yeah. picture of you two together because you yeah. you played in a game together as well, didn't you? We did. Look at the yeah. Look at the <laughs> look at the barnet. Yeah. Um, no, that States, was a wonderful night actually to play with Diego, and it was it was especially anyone that went to that game. It was a fabulous night. Played, I think, Inter Milan, mm. Tottenham for Aussie's testimony. Beautiful time. Um, so, which uh, attribute do you wish that you'd had as a player? You had plenty, but one that I, you were missing. I would say, if I had, if I'd have, if I could have had Johan Cruyff's turn of pace, <laughs> he was lightning from from a stop position yeah. to go in. You know, he was so quick. I would love to have had that up my sleeve. Which number ten do you wish you'd played alongside? Well, I think it's got. I got. It's got to be. Diego. Yeah. It's got to be Diego on that one. Although there's so many that you would love to play with. Yeah, I've got to say. <laughs> Any of the above in the last hour or so. Yeah. Um, most underrated number 10? Zico, without a doubt. Brazilian he was, star. He was out of this world. Favourite goal from a number 10? Can you think of one that stands oh, out? Is that going to be Maradona again? Some, I'm going to be really boring now. I mean, how can you go... I mean, we saw Dennis score some wonderful goals mm. in there. There's just so many goals, isn't there, we've seen. Dennis Burkamp, but, but Maradona's goal again. I was playing in that game. The pitch was horrible as well. Yeah. Dreadful, but his, his dribble against England at a World Cup, you know, unbelievable goal. Best passer, number 10. Oh, that's, that's really tough, you know. Would it be Scolzi? I mean, the man Scolzi, that you coached? Scolzi was an excellent park. Yeah, because he, could, he, he ended up playing deep and, and hitting passes more when he played deep. So I think I'd go for Paul. I'll go for Paul, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of good ones up there, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then just to finish, is number 10 the hardest position on the pitch? Which I think the, no, uh, the answer, Glenn, is. It's the most important position in the pitch, <laughs> in my opinion. And it's not as easy as people think, as we've gone through today. It's the most important. And you have to have so many different attributes. Yeah. Love spending the last hour with you, Love Ben. The Enjoyed football it. brain, loving all of it. There we go, the pioneer of the number 10, Mr Glenn Hoddle. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. For even more Premier League content, from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you over there.